In the last lecture, we looked at um, what's called low resolution NMR, and we showed that NMR can be useful for actually seeing the different types of elements, but that isn't super useful in and of itself. What we need is to understand um, more deeply how each of the same type of nuclei differ from one another. To do that, we can use a technique called high resolution NMR. So getting into it, high resolution NMR, and um, I would usually stop there, but let's go ahead and just remind ourselves that we are performing a technique in spectroscopy. Now, uh, the key feature of high resolution NMR is that we're going to look at a single nucleus. So I'm gonna call this mononuclear. That is, we're only examining one type of nucleus. <clears throat> okay, so to do this, um, or the reason why we would do this is this allows us to differentiate uh, nuclei um, from one another that are the same type or that are of the same element. Okay, now that might be kind of hard to digest without looking at um, some specific examples. So let's add this. Let's um, kind of suggest, or let me, let me suggest that each 1H atom in a molecule is likely somewhat different. Let's just you know, further qualify that slightly different than the other 1H atoms. Okay, they're similar, but similar still means different. They're close. Um, I mean, they have the same protons and neutrons. They're gonna be both around 300, but one might slightly diff, uh, be above 300 megahertz, one slightly below as an example, because the hydrogen atoms in a, in a molecule might be in what we call different chemical environments. So the chemical environment of the atom will cause atoms to differ very slightly so what we need to do is increase the resolution go to high resolution so that we can resolve that's where this comes from resolve those differences so high resolution can resolve the differences Okay, so that's kind of the lead into um, what we're trying to look at here. So let's actually do um, a sort of thought experiment. Let's take an actual molecule this time. So let's have chlorobenzene. So if you recall with benzene, it doesn't matter where I put my alternating double bonds and single bonds because they actually, what we'll show in um, module three maybe, I'm, I'm thinking around there module three or four is that the, um, Double bonds can be in any orientation and it's both structures kind of what they do is they contribute to the overall structure of the molecule. So it doesn't matter where the double bonds are. Now that's somewhat important, but not the critical thing. Let's do a 1H NMR experiment. Let's do a low res 1H NMR experiment. What I'm saying here is let's do a typical 1H NMR experiment and zoom in around 300 megahertz. What we see is that we have a peak. This indicates to us that this molecule likely has a hydrogen atom, okay, because uh, specifically a 1H isotope of hydrogen, because we see that peak 
at 300 megahertz. Okay, now it's only one peak because this is low resolution. We can't resolve the differences between the other five hydrogens. And if you want to, let's go ahead and draw with bond line structures. Maybe it's been a year and a half for some of you since we've drawn these. Let's go ahead and draw them again. So there's benzene. I'm going to draw the implicit hydrogens explicitly. Okay. So we have one peak, it's around 300 megahertz. That indicates to us we have one H atoms. And again, that's not really that impressive. We probably figured we would have some one H atoms if this was an organic molecule, but I'm telling you, we actually know the um, structure. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the resolution for the experiment. Okay, the, the resolution means I'm going to zoom in 300, uh, 300 megahertz. I'm going to go right here and I'm going to say, let's take that so that instead of you know spanning from whatever that scale is, maybe it's like 290 to 310, instead of that range, we're going to have a different width of our X axis. Maybe it's 299.5 and then it's 300 megahertz, okay? So we're cutting off the, the, the right side, looking only at the left side, but a much narrow, narrower range. What happens is, is this peak that looked like one peak in the low resolution experiment, now that we're in the high res experiment, we can actually resolve the fact that we have three, whoops, I don't know why that did that. three different peaks. Maybe I'll make them, let's let's just, sorry. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna make them the same height. All right, let's not worry about some of the subtleties yet. But I guess we already have, we've, we've taken this one peak and we've resolved it into three separate peaks now. We have three peaks near 300. In the low resolution experiment, they all sort of glob together to make a single peak. But when we resolve, when we enhance the resolution, we can resolve the three peaks, okay? Now, what we want to show here, or what we can see here, is we can see the subtle difference between the hydrogen atoms. Let me redraw that structure. So I have a six-membered ring, alternating double bonds and single bonds. It doesn't matter where. Just put the chlorine on top. Now we have five hydrogens. Now I know these hydrogen atoms are all of the same atom type. Okay, so they all have the same ratio of isotopes. But let's go ahead and just for the sake of our understanding, have a subtle, have, have a secondary label. This is just for us. I'm going to call this HA, this HB, this HC, B, and E. Okay, for the five hydrogen atoms that are present in the molecule. Again, these hydrogen atoms all inside their nuclei are the same. They're all the same hybridization state for the most, I mean, they're all the same hybridization state. They're, they're all more or less the same. It's just that if you look, some of them are sort of closer and further away from the chlorine atom. So I'm just gonna make note that HA is closer to chlorine than HB which is closer to, uh, closer than HC. So if you look between A, B, and C, ignoring D and E for the moment, A, B, and C all are sort of, have uh, um, different distances from that chlorine atom. Now what we say then is we say that H A and H B, I shouldn't have drawn this so close to the end of the page. H A and H B and H C are in different chemical environments. So let's go ahead and do that. H A, H B, and H C are in different chemical environments. Okay, HA is close to chlorine atom. I know it's they're both attached to carbons that are part of benzene rings, but one's closer to a chlorine than the other two. 
okay? And then B is in the middle. It's kind of not as close as A, but it's closer than C. Hopefully you get it. Now, what about H, H, E, and H, D? Well, let's go back. So looking at our structure, H, A, and H, E. Look at those two. Between H, A, and H, E, which is closer or further away from the chlorine atom? Well, if you look at them, they're actually both, you know, three bonds separated from that chlorine atom. I would say they're both equidistant from that chlorine atom. And as a result, I know I've got a little A and an E written, but I can't tell the difference between these two. H A and H E, due to symmetry of the molecule, specifically bilateral symmetry, are actually in the same chemical environment. So H A and H E are in the same chemical environment. Everything about them appears to be the same. Now, what about HD? Well, HD is in the same chemical environment as HB. So HB and HD are in the same chemical environment. So this idea of the chemical environment while it's not something we'll like be super rigorous about, we're just going to look by inspection. Due to symmetry, do molecules have the opportunity to put atoms in different or similar chemical environments? Okay, so what we can do is high resolution NMR or high res NMR can tell the difference. between atoms in different just erase that atoms in different chemical environments okay so let's go back to our spectrum. Again, I said if we range from 299.5 to 300 on our frequency scale, a very tight range, we saw three peaks. These three peaks correspond to three different chemical environments. So we could call them three different 1H atoms. And by different, I'm referring to different chemical environments. It's not protons and neutrons. Such differences in atom uh, would lead to different atom types, okay? Whether that's an isotope or a different element altogether, and you'd see a huge difference in the absorption frequency, like going from 300 to 45, just by adding a neutron. What I'm talking about here is just putting something closer or further away from different elements within a molecule, okay? And these subtle differences can be picked up by high resolution NMR. And so we can see three peaks. Now, all of a sudden, this technique becomes much more useful because if we can see three peaks, we can tell ourselves, ooh, I know I've got hydrogens, and if I know how many hydrogens and carbons and chlorines I have from mass spectrometry, which I alluded to last time, then perhaps I can start to propose a structure because I have to draw a molecule now where the hydrogen atoms have sufficient symmetry so that there are three different chemical environments about the hydrogen atoms. So we can start to gain insight into the structure and propose the structure without um, without uh, having to, uh, or, I mean, we can, we can propose a structure with this technique. Now let's change the nucleus for a second and look at carbon-13 NMR. So high res carbon-13 NMR. Now we're gonna look at the exact same molecule and I want you to think about 
how many signals you would expect. Recall that what we're doing is we're taking the low resolution signal, which is at 75 megahertz, and we're sort of zooming in on that peak. We're increasing the resolution to get, we're increasing the resolution, which should allow us to see um, uh, more uh, peaks because we'll be able to see now carbon atoms in different chemical environments. So I no longer need to draw the hydrogen atoms. I can just consider the carbon atoms. Okay, if you want, I can go ahead and expand the structure. So carbon, 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 and then double, single, double. Okay, so let's start here. We have A, B, C, C, D, E, and F. So I have six carbons in my molecule. We had five hydrogens before. It's because you know we had a chlorine atom present. Anyway, okay, so we have six carbon atoms. What we would expect to see then is we have, if I if I do like some some color highlighting here, A is in a chemical environment all by itself. It's the only one that's directly attached to a carbon atom or a chlorine atom, excuse me. C and F, or excuse me, B and F are actually identical. Similarly. A and E are identical, and I don't know if I can, yeah, okay. And then we have D, I'm gonna bring this color back. Okay, so if you look, I actually have three different colors. So if I consider my NMR spectrum, I should then have uh, four peaks. Why four instead of six? Well. F was the same as B, E was the same as C due to bilateral symmetry. Now why, you might be asking, well, why three instead of four? Well, we get an extra one from A because while that carbon doesn't have a hydrogen to contribute a sixth hydrogen or a fourth signal with bilateral symmetry, it does, it is a carbon. So we will get that extra signal from the carbon atom. And so somewhere between 74.5 and 76.5, the subtle differences will emerge and we will see four peaks present in the NMR spectrum, four peaks, which means we have carbon atoms and we can pick up the carbon-13 minor contributing isotope, carbon-13 atoms in four different environments. Okay. So we have four unique carbon atoms. They're subtly different. Now, two of the peaks, two of the signals in our, from our NMR experiment are going to be from um, uh, signals that correspond to, uh, to a, a chemical environment with two carbons present. So that's sort of the experiment. We can look at those subtle differences based on the relative position inside a molecule. This allows us to see differences in elements that have the same number of protons and neutrons, which is really powerful because for the most part, when we look at our molecules, we just have carbon, we just have hydrogen. So we really just have these two elemental types. And then occasionally we have another NMR active nucleus, like a fluorine floating around, but we, you know, there's only one of them. And so uh, when you've got sometimes 20 carbon atoms and 35 hydrogen atoms, for example, uh, in some bigger molecules with one fluorine atom, all of a sudden that one, that, you know, the NMR spectrum is just going to have three peaks despite having um, so many elements. So this allows us to see those differences in chemical environment and really get an insight into the structure. So um, before we break for this lecture, let's take a second to talk about how we can um, achieve high resolution. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and go on to another page here. So how do we achieve high resolution NMR? Okay. Well, the way that just kind of makes sense is to increase H0. That's sort of the, I'll call it the most productive way. I wish it wasn't because it makes for a huge technical and engineering challenge, but we're going to have to increase H0. And for the JAWS reference of the day, 
we're going to need a bigger magnet. So we're going to need a bigger magnet. All right, so I mentioned that at Ripon College, um, so we have a seven Tesla magnet. We have a seven Tesla magnet. Now this is often called a 300 megahertz NMR because that's the absorption frequency of the 1H atom. We've been talking about that, this. So this is what people call it. And they're like, what kind of NMR do you have? They talk to me on the phone, what kind of NMR do you have? I'll say 300 megahertz NMR. And then they'll know that they may not remember the number seven Tesla unless they you know, also teach organic chemistry too, or the NMR topics in organic chemistry, but they'll know what that means. They'll know that what they can expect is that the 1H atom will flip or absorb at 300 megahertz. When I was in um, grad school and just at some larger institutions, you'll see um, even for routine samples, you'll see larger magnets. So um, also common, this one's fairly common. The, the really big ones are fairly specialized, but also common is the 11.8 Tesla magnet. So again, I'm not gonna, this isn't um, electricity and magnetism. Just trust me when you're getting up into whole Tesla units, these are really big magnets. Okay, um, so the 11.8 Tesla magnet is also called the 500 megahertz NMR. And the 500 megahertz NMR just indicates that 1H will absorb at 500 megahertz. So they name these four protons, excuse me, one, the 1H atom, which is also called the proton, they name these for the protons because that's the most commonly studied nuclei because it's both abundant and quite sensitive as an NMR active nucleus. Um, and it's not only abundant in terms of um, its isotopic abundance, it's just, not, it's just commonly abundant in the molecules that people like to study. Now, what we need to appreciate to understand how we achieve high resolution is that bigger magnets or a bigger H0 provides greater resolution um, and increased frequency for absorption. So you won't ever increase the magnetic field strength, but then see a decrease in the frequency for absorption. Okay, so that's an important takeaway from this. Now, how do we get there? We can actually see this from even our, um, you know, less than fully physical understanding of what's happening in NMR systems. So why does, let's ask the question, why does frequency, which is new, increase when we increase H0. Well, what's going on here is when we increase H0, the energy required to flip or to oppose H0. Now, this is called the beta state of the molecule. So what I'm saying is, sure, I'll write it as a Okay, beta state. So what I'm saying is if you want to be in the beta state, which is what we're doing when we try to flip these nuclei, okay, if you want to be in the beta state, it costs um, even more energy. The magnetic field is even stronger. So even though you're always aligned vertically, half of the population thereabouts is aligned in the opposite direction. And we flip the naturally aligned or kind of um, more um, favorably aligned molecules over with radio frequency, radio uh, with radiation in the radio wave range. Okay, so as that magnetic field gets stronger, it costs a lot more energy. It's just inherently a lot more difficult to oppose that magnetic field, right? That makes sense. It's kind of like 
Um, I mean, if, I don't know, I mean, if, if however you want to think about H0, if it's hard to appreciate magnetic fields, it, it's kind of like a windier day. If you try to stand and oppose a, a stronger gust of wind, it's just going to be harder. It's going to require, and by harder, I mean, it's going to require more energy. So that beta state, the difference in energy between the alpha and the beta state is going to increase. Energy required to oppose H0 goes up. And what this means is that the energy gap between alpha and beta, this is again the, the thing that we want to flip. We want to flip from alpha to beta. The energy gap between alpha and beta goes up. Now in any absorption event, to get from the ground state, which is our alpha state, to the excited state, which is the beta state. In an absorption event, the energy required or the energy supplied must be exactly equivalent to the gap in energy between the ground state and the excited state. So what's kind of happening here is if we have some beta state and some alpha state, what we're doing if we increase H O is that now the beta state will be higher in energy. And so the energy gap now is greater. Energy gap, okay? That means we require more energy to flip the states or to do excitation. All right, so just, just a reminder, that doesn't mean more light. That doesn't mean a brighter light. What that is, is that's a changing of the frequency. E is equal to H nu. So we have to, if we're going to increase E, we need to increase nu as E goes up, then nu also goes up because E equals H nu. The light needs to be of higher energy, okay? It can be the same, um, it can be the same kind of abundance of photons, but those photons individually must be higher in energy to achieve the excitation event. Okay, so we see a greater E Okay, all of this does is it explains that when the magnet gets bigger, the number 300 megahertz could change to 500 megahertz and so on and so forth. I mean, I've seen things that look like NMRs that look like, you know, Apollo 13, uh, big enough to like hold people and um, they can get up to like a thousand megahertz. Um, I think they call those gigahertz NMRs. And so you can get some really big NMR magnets. Now, why would you do that? Okay, all we know so far is the magnet gets bigger, the energy required to flip gets bigger. Well, why you do that is you get to the opportunities for high resolution NMR. So with bigger H zeros, we get bigger or larger. I'm gonna change that to larger, larger required news, which is our frequency. Okay, now additionally, the subtle differences in chemical environment So the really subtle changes in chemical environment become more pronounced. The subtle differences. So the fact that you are a little bit closer to that chlorine atom, okay? That's not adding neutrons. That's not adding protons. That's not gonna do that much of a difference to the alpha and beta state flip. But because now the alpha to beta state flipped 
energy gap is so large, okay, you can start to, our detectors can start to detect the difference in energy between those very subtle differences, okay? So just by making the energy gap larger, the computer can start to tell if, if something doesn't require as high of an energy gap or a little bit higher, just by really, you know, in the grand scheme of 300 megahertz, 299.5, well, 299.5 is something we can work with. However, if the magnetic field is really small and the energy gap is really small, okay, the light required can be low energy, which might be beneficial. Again, we're in the radio wave, so it doesn't really, I'm not too worried about it, but the, the frequency of the light can be really small, but the computer can't tell the difference between the really subtle chemical environments. I see some people trying to sell 90 megahertz NMRs because they can fit on a bench top, but we just, you know, it's, it's hard to use them unless the chemical environments are so uh, dramatically different. Now, why would you want to go up so big? Like, why, why do we have 300 and the folks in the big institutions have like gigahertz NMRs? Well, what I'm doing with the 300 megahertz is looking at differences in chemical environment that are like a CH2 on a molecule versus a benzene ring or a CH2 that's close to, that's close to um, a CH3 versus a CH2 that's close to an OH. So even though it's the same type, they're all organic molecules, you can get some pretty different chemical environments even within an organic molecule. So 300 megahertz is sufficient. Now what you can do with a gigahertz in Mars, is you can start to look at biomolecules because biomolecules for the most part are just built with the same pieces over and over again with really, really subtle differences. For example, proteins are kind of all built from amino acids and all have the same backbone. But what you can do with a gigahertz NMR is you can tell even the subtlest of differences due to how proteins are sort of folding. So you can start to look at protein NMR along with other large biomolecule NMRs. Um, and so that's why you want to achieve super high resolution, um, practically speaking. So 300 megahertz is good enough for what we're doing at Ripon College. But if you wanted to put a protein into an NMR and actually resolve the entire structure using multi-dimensional NMR techniques, you really need to get into higher magnetic fields. Okay, so that'll do it for this lecture. Um, what we'll start to do in the next few lectures is look at interpreting the actual data behind the NMR spectrum.